Welcome, Welcome to, to Factorally. Factorly. Hello, Simon. Hello, Bruce. How are you today? I'm feeling very sweet. Thank you very much. How are you? Uh, equally candelicious. <laughs> <laughs> Is that because today we're talking about confection? No, no, that's just my general state of mind. Ah. Um, it's pure coincidence that we're going to be talking about confection. <laughs> ah, because confection means all sorts of things, but today I guess we're going to be talking about the stuff you eat rather than the confections that one makes. Yeah, so there's there's a there's a connection there's a confection connection uh, in uh. the in the word. Um, confection comes from the old Latin word. We, we'd like to start this show with a little bit of etymology. I Etym- don't know if etymology our, our is always dear listeners. Why do people sometimes this? say entomology, which is about insects? That's the study of insects, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, totally different. <laughs> Unless you were studying the etymology of entomology, in which case it would be valid. It would. There's a Gilbert and Sullivan song in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, the the Latin word is uh, confissere, which literally means to put together. Uh, that came through Old French into Old English to confect, to mix together. So in in sweet terms, in candy terms, that is mixing together the ingredients to make a confection. But also the the other sense of the word, you know, the confections you make sort of has that common link. It's to, to string together or to create right. something. Right. Yeah. Um, so what interesting things have you found out about confection? Well, you, you talked about the, the origin of the word confection. The origin of confection is, is quite... I mean, confection as such, sweets, candy yeah. as such, has been around for a long time, since sort of the Egyptians, sort of like three, three or 4,000 years it's been around, mm. starting mostly with honey. Yes. There's a lot of honey-based sweets and honey and nuts... Um, mixed together, that that kind of sweet rather yes, than right. the sort of sweets that we know today. I, I actually found uh, on on the honey front, I found evidence of um, some old cave paintings of um, drawings of people dipping their their hand into a, a beehive and putting the honey in their mouth. So there's evidence of people actually eating sweet food in in that sense since ah. cavemen times. Yes, that's that's a bit like the Tate and Lyle. A uh, golden syrup thing, isn't it? From from strength came sweetness. Nice. People people don't look at the front of the tin of that, which has a swarm of bees swarming out of a dead lion's stomach. Does it really? Yes. And, and that's, that's what that's why it says from strength came sweetness. Awesome. And that's a biblical thing, isn't it? Yes. Someone was posing a riddle to someone or the other, and the answer was a dead lion filled with bees. As it would be. <laughs> Why wouldn't it yeah. be? <laughs> so next, next time you're in the supermarket, have a look at a tin of uh, golden syrup and you will see that on the front. I've got some in my cupboard. I'll have a look later. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so, so, so uh, honey. Um, but then um, I guess bringing it more up to date in the sort of 1800s, su- sweets were kind of medicine or they're, they're sort of combined with medicine. Mm. So that if, if you had horrible tasting medicine, you would, you would either encase it or serve it with something sweet. Yes, okay. Okay. And that still stands true today, doesn't it? You you take a, an ibuprofen capsule or something like that. It it does taste vaguely sweet. As as I believe uh, Poppins said, um a spoonful of sugar does indeed help the medicine go down. Yeah, absolutely. One of the oldest ones that's still in existence that was that was technically a medicine was licorice. Right, okay. So licorice was invented as a medicine as a, a sort of for your chest. Ah. And uh, it's still you can still buy still buy all sorts of different licorice now. Yeah. So we all think of licorice as being the the, the, the sort of the black chewy gummy bassets all sorts type type thing. Yes. Um, but at its rawest form, it's um, it's just liquid that you extract from a a root, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Same, it's, it's similar to uh, to it's an anise. Uh, mm-hmm. Effectively, it's like. Um, uh, like a pastis that you have in in France, or right. or sort of all sorts of ouzo star star anise in in Indian cooking, and lots of people have it and make it into alcohol, which right. which generally tastes great while you're on holiday. Okay, <laughs> and, then, and then you bring it home and you go, "Why on earth did I buy this?" That was so spare of the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is your uh, favourite Bassett's all sort? If indeed you have one, you might hate licorice. Ooh, um, I don't hate li- I, I don't hate licorice. I actually really love uh, raspberry or strawberry licorice. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I have a I, I have a very sweet tooth. Do you? So uh, <laughs> I have to, I have to be a bit careful. <laughs> I really like the um, the pink. Coconut circles with oh, a little blob do. of licorice that, that, in the middle. 
That's very divisive. Um, <laughs> that there are people who, who like those and people who absolutely hate them. Yes, that's true. I'm on the um, like side. I quite, I mean, it's a bit like eating a Kit Kat where you kind of like strip off the chocolate from the sides. I quite like eating the ones where there's layers of sort of sweetness and then licorice and they're kind of like oh, just, the just trying to peel off, peel off the sandwiches. Yeah, nice. <laughs> Fancy some licorice now. <laughs> I, have, I have some. <laughs> Do you? I'll oh, pass it over. <laughs> Through the airwaves. <laughs> But the sort of the, the gummy the gumminess of of licorice is is nice, and um, gummy sort of sweets are, have been around for a while. And my 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 favourite gummy sweets, as are the the favourite gummy sweets of most of the Doctors Who, um, are jelly babies. Can I interest you in a jelly baby? <laughs> exactly. Just as a side note, I appreciate the fact that you said Doctors Who rather than Doctor Who's. Well, thank you very I much. I love that. <laughs> of course, yes. One, one would. Coles de sac, not <laughs> cul de sacs, et cetera. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, well, one has to. Because it's correct. Yes. I mean, they, 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 they've actually appeared in, in lots of the Doctors, uh, in Doctor Who. Um, Did they? And I think Terry Pratchett's used them. All, all sorts of oh. people have used Jelly Babies. They, they, they were invented um, a while ago. Because they were originally they were originally sold in about 1850, oh, were they? 1853 oh. by Bassett's of yes. Sheffield, yes. and they were originally um, called unclaimed babies. <laughs> <laughs> at, at, at a time where there were quite a few orphans. Um, oh my goodness! An Austrian guy working at Friars of Lancashire, right? Uh, originally marketed them as unclaimed babies. And then uh, immediately after the First World War, they were the name was changed uh, to Peace Babies. Oh, and I'm not uh, sure which one of those I would feel worse about eating, <laughs> unclaimed or peace. <laughs> and then and then they were they were Peace Babies until the Second World War, and then they they production was suspended because they didn't have any sugar or anything. Yes. Um, and then, focus on more important things. Well, exactly. And then when they came back in in 1953. Uh, they thought, well, we can't call them peace babies. We certainly can't call them unclaimed babies. So they were called jelly babies. Fantastic. And the thing that my research on jelly babies went far too far. (laughs) (laughs) And I discovered that all the jelly babies have names. No, what the different colours of them. Yep. So the red one, the strawberry one is called Brilliant. The yellow lemony one is called Bubbles. The pink raspberry one is called Baby Bonnie. The green and lime one, the sort of limeish one, is called Boofles. The Thank your pardon? Boofles. 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 Wow. And Big Heart is the purple blackcurrant one. Okay. And Bumper. Bumper is the orange one. I don't get that. I don't get it either. I don't get any of them, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Are we trying to look for meaning where there is none? <laughs> yes, and 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 that was that was uh, the 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 different shapes and names was a, was an innovation in about nine, in the late nineteen eighties. Uh, Wait, are you because, telling me the jelly babies are all different shapes? Uh, yes, they are. I clearly haven't <laughs> eaten a jelly baby in a long time. <laughs> really? Apparently, they're in what sort? Of, they're in different poses. Yeah, absolutely. This is um, this is nothing to do with confection, but it is to do with what you've just been mentioning. I found out last week um, that McDonald's chicken nuggets come in four different shapes. I, really? I, I previously I'd only ever been able to identify two, uh, and they're both quite distinct. There's sort of a circular one and one that looks vaguely like Italy in shape. Okay. Uh, but apparently there are four distinct shapes, and they all have names as well. And those names are the bell, the bow tie, the ball, and the boot. <laughs> now, the, obviously, this isn't really in public knowledge. This is just tickling the funny bones of someone who works in the higher echelons of McDonald's going, I'm a bit bored. Let's give our chicken nuggets names. <laughs> I, I think this would be the, the subject of a thesis by one of the professors at um, Hamburg, the University of Hamburgerology. Hamburgerology? <laughs> Which is the McDonald's University that actually exists. Really? Yes. I love that. I want to study there. <laughs> I want a diploma. Yes, and, and 
Yeah, so the, the McNugget is probably part of that. Great. Well, there you go. That's for free, folks. You uh, you tuned in to hear us talk about confection, and you've ended up learning about the University of Burgerology. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know that much more about sweets. I kind of concentrated a bit more on my downfall, which is which is chocolate. <laughs> yes. But did you did you learn much more about sweets? So I did a few. I did, it's it's quite difficult these days to separate sweets from chocolate, isn't it? You know, the, the, the chocolate is such a, a domineering element of the market. Um, I don't really like sweets that much. I love chocolate. I don't really like the gummy things. I don't like jelly babies. My son loves really sour fizzy chewy things which just make me cringe and make me worry about how much i'm going to have to spend at the dentist there's a there's a scottish um sweet i mean the scots are mad about boiled sweets yeah absolutely in, insane about them and there's one called sour plums sour, plums. sour, sour plums yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. but i just think I, I, I get all sorts of images in my head when I think of sour plums, and, but sour plums is just great. <laughs> um, before we embark on chocolate, which I think uh, obviously we we must, um, the other type of sweet, I guess, if we're talking about boiled sweets, that I, I did look at was um, a stick of rock. Ah. Um, an American friend of mine had um, has recently moved to the country and he said that he had heard of this thing called rock but had never experienced it and, and could I tell him what it was, was all about and I thought well actually I don't really know that much about it so I did this research purely for him um, but um, a stick of rock to anyone who isn't familiar it's a, a cylindrical hard boiled candy for want of a better word uh, with lots of different colours, often in stripes. It often has writing through the middle of it to tell you where you bought it. Um, and it comes wrapped in cellophane. You usually buy it at tourist uh, tourist places. You know, The seaside is, is quite prevalent. Also, apparently, in um, Windsor, which I discovered a little while ago. There is a, there's a shop that sells Windsor Rock. Um, and uh, this originated in the, the 19th century, usually sold at fairgrounds, and it was called Fair Rock. Uh, it wasn't colourful, it was just a plain stick of, of boiled sweet, didn't have the writing in it. Um, and as many of these things do, there are vastly varying theories as to who f sort of first came up with the idea of putting letters and colours into it. Um, there are two Victorian names that have, have come up. One was called, I mean they've got to be false just because of their names. One chap was called Ben Bullock, who was an ex-miner from Burnley. Uh, the, Bu and the Burnley Bullocks. The Burnley Bullocks. So Ben Bullock from Burnley was on holiday in Blackpool. <laughs> and he's, okay. he found some of this. Are there any more bees involved in this story? Not in this one, no. <laughs> we'll come on to the D's in a minute. Um, and he found this this fair rock at a, at a fairground in, in Blackpool. And he thought, wouldn't it be fun to put lettering into this? Uh, the other alternative is a fellow called Dynamite Dick uh, from Morecambe. <laughs> Who, who came up with much the same idea around the same time? Who knows who to believe? But anyway, the way you make rock, you, uh, you, you sort of make, um, you make lots of sheets of sugary, colourful yuckiness, um, which are still sort of quite soft and squidgy, and you layer the sheets one upon the other upon the other. You insert uh, an elongated letter uh, in, in sort of like a stick form. Uh, you lay it all out onto this sheet, and then you roll the sheet and roll it and roll it and roll it until it becomes sort of a, an inch or so in, in diameter, and, and that's how you get rock. Uh, personally, I can't stand the stuff, um, but I bought a stick of it for my American friend, and he was chuffed. Do you know it starts out as a very, very big roll, like almost like a tree trunk? It's massive, isn't it, when, when you it, first begin, huge. because they make so much of it, and it's, it's, it's fresh and hot, and yeah. But then what they do is, whilst it's hot, they, put, they extrude it, so that this big, this huge um, log logs width of of sweet mm. basically is extruded through a, through a thing, and it comes out as like a, a one inch yes. um, diameter thing, or even even smaller. And the, and the lettering shrinks as obviously as it's extruded, yeah. the lettering shrinks. Yeah. There was a there's a TV thing on uh, I think it might have been on Netflix uh, recently um, about a, a a girl who wanted to be a comedian. Right. And she wants to be Lucille Ball in England. Right. And she's from the north. And uh, she actually, her dad works in a rock factory. Okay. 
Uh, hence the, the the link between this this uh, massive TV series, which is hugely successful, which I can't remember the name. <laughs> and um, wasn't called Brighton Rock, was it? No, it wasn't. Brighton Rock's a whole other thing. <laughs> but so is Edinburgh Rock. Edinburgh Rock is a whole other thing as well. Edinburgh Rock is like a is a is a soft version of that hard rock. You can buy boxes of Edinburgh Rock, right. which is which is very similar, but it's actually quite crumbly. Do you know what? This suddenly makes sense to me because um, I mentioned going to Windsor and finding a stick of rock there of all places. I bought it in the Edinburgh Woolen Mill and it was soft and, and I didn't know whether it, it, it had gone off because I was sure I remembered as a child rock being so hard that it could almost break your teeth, you know, and, yeah, and there was this hard, stock yeah. of minty squidgeness. But that, that's the Edinburgh... Mill, that's, so that's that the Edinburgh sense. style ah, Edinburgh rock. See, even I'm learning things in this podcast. So that's bold sweets. Uh, you're you're obviously into your squidgy, gummy sweets. Uh, well, I'm yes, but not. but ultimately, I think we're, what we're both into, yeah, is the um, morally difficult chocolate. Even the word sounds tasty, doesn't it? I'm just going to lean does. into my microphone. Chocolate. It just sounds, oh. Or even in French, chocolat. chocolat. Yeah, chocolat. There's a very, very good hot chocolate shop in Paris. Is there? Really good. You would really hope there would be. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, speaking of hot chocolate, so we can, we can go all the way back to the Aztecs uh, living in, in what is now Mexico. Uh, they extracted cocoa beans uh, to make a, a hot but bitter drink it, it wouldn't really have resembled what we would think of as as cocoa or hot chocolate or, or anything like that nowadays it was it was quite bitter um it wasn't until a good one and a half thousand years later that someone decided to mix it with sugar and and turn it into a sweet drink oh. uh, so it was essentially a, a bitter drink for a really really long time um they used to use it as part there was a there's a mexican dish which is like turkey with chocolate really yeah which is uh, delicious huh. but um it, it doesn't taste anything like chocolate no i can't uh, I, I i've never had anything that sort of is anything like the original bitter drink you know i i think of hot chocolate and i usually think of cadbury's you know powdered stuff which has yes gallons and gallons of sugar in it i'm sure um it tastes very nice it does. Yeah, I have a. I, I was given for Christmas a, a, a Hotel Chocolat um, hot chocolate making machine. Oh, lucky you. Which is very good. You just sort of top, you fill it up with chocolate. You open a, a sachet of the Hotel Chocolat, various different flavors of chocolate, yeah. and pour it in there and then press a button. And it heats the milk and, and stirs it at the same time. So it's always perfect. Oh, nice. But my favourite, my favourite um, drinking chocolate, hot chocolate, is made by a company called Charbonnel and Walker, Ooh. who um, have lots of royal warrants on the on the on the tin. Okay, and they are that that is almost as good as the chocolate in Paris. Really, as the hot chocolate? Yeah, it's I'll delicious. Have to look out for that, I discovered something called drinking fudge a couple of years ago. Ah, um, it's exactly what you would imagine it to be. If if hot chocolate is, is the liquid form of chocolate. Hot fudge, <laughs> drinking fudge, is the liquid form of fudge. I've never tasted anything so sickly. I shan't be rushing back for more. <laughs> it came in a very, very small, sort of like an espresso-sized cup, and you really wouldn't want more than that. So it was, it was a drink for a long time, though, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, hot chocolate. Uh, well, cho cho when you said, should we go for chocolate, you meant, shall we go for a drink of chocolate? Yes, absolutely, yes. It didn't, it didn't sort of um, become a, a, a solidified bar. Uh, for a, for a very long time afterwards, did it? I think it was um, you. You mentioned fries earlier on, didn't you? So in in eighteen fifty three, oh. uh, fries launched uh, a chocolate cream stick, ah, uh, later known as a bar rather than a stick. And he he launched this this name chocolate cream bars in eighteen sixty six, and that's kind of where it all began. And then um, a handful of years later, John Cadbury from Birmingham. Uh, had opened up a, a a tea and coffee and drinking chocolate shop in in 1824, and then he sort of caught on to this idea of solidified chocolate and uh, and created the Cadbury's Dairy Milk Bar in 1905. Yes, which I have to say is just one of my favourite things to consume. 
it, it, ever. It's it's dirty chocolate. It's it's street chocolate. It it, it, <laughs> it, it it's 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 you know there, it doesn't cost that much to get a real good sugar hit. Yes, yes. It's like the fast food of the chocolate world, it isn't is. it? It's um, I mean, I suppose it depends who you talk to. You know, again, a, a couple of American friends who who sort of first came to England, they don't have Cadbury's, or at least they didn't at the time have Cadbury's over there. They had Hershey's. Um, and they were just gobsmacked at the quality of this, this chocolate in this purple wrapper. You know, in what, what incredibly good quality it was, how sweet it was, how creamy it was. Um, so it's all relative, I guess. Well, the Hers- I mean, Hershey came up with his own formula for a, for a, for a bar that tastes like urine, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is a, I do have a link between Hershey and Cadbury, which is a personal Ooh. link, which is that Ooh. I have been to both Cadbury World and Hershey World. Have you? Hershey World in Pennsylvania is, is, a, uh, is a fun fair based around Hershey. And there is actually a, like a water slide, which is fil- filled with like, sort of a watery chocolate. Oh, how Willy Wonka. <laughs> That's fantastic. It is very Wonka. Wow. I've never been, I've I've been to the Cadbury World near near Birmingham and yes. that is um it's splendid. <laughs> well, I mean the, both both sort of in in, in similar ways cuz uh, they were Quakers. Uh, well, actually yeah. the Cadbury's were Quakers, the the Hershey's were uh, a a different sect and um so the the Cadbury's wanted to build a place. They they, they were looking at the Garden suburb, where people yeah. were sort of like they were building new towns, uh, which were based around a garden, yeah. and and the Cadbury said, "Well, if you can build residential around a garden, yes. why can't you build a factory around a garden?" And so they 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 they, they bought a whole load of land just outside Birmingham, called it Bourneville, yes, and and built the, built this whole community which which supported the factory, so that so the community effectively worked for the factory. Yeah, um, but they got uh, doctors. They got you know at a time when there was no NHS, they got free free medication, uh, f- free schooling. The whole thing was based around being nice to your workers. Oh, imagine that as an ethos. <laughs> <laughs> And then that's what gave rise to the Bourneville chocolate bar. Um, I, I don't know if the story is true, but I've heard it said that the workers were so enamoured with this place, Bourneville, and, and you know their, their employers' generosity and 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 looking after their welfare, that they decided to to mock up a, a plain a plain chocolate bar in honour of this place and, and called it Bourneville and sort of presented it to Mr. Cadbury as a as a thank you. Yes. Generally speaking, the workers in chocolate factories when they first started were very well taken care of. I mean, Hershey's uh, does a, I think they have an an industrial school in America. It's quite well known, the Hershey Industrial School. And also, both of them give millions and millions and millions of pounds to charity every year. Yes, yes. I I think it's, it's, some of it is to make up for the, shall we say, the source of the sugar and the cocoa was was not always uh, entirely ethical. Absolutely no. Well, let's let's have a, a chat about sugar itself. So, because you know we've talked about bitter chocolate, we've talked about honey, um, but uh, obviously sugar is is the basis of all of this stuff. We wouldn't have modern day chocolate. We wouldn't have rock. We wouldn't have licorice. We wouldn't have all of these things without sugar. Um, so, sugar cane juice uh, was being produced all the way back in four thousand BC uh, in in India and Southeast Asia. Um, and it wasn't until the first century AD that they started granulating this this sugary liquid um, and, and sort of using it in the in the form that we would, crystals. we would see it today. It was crystals, yeah. yeah. But as you've alluded to, there's obviously a, a much darker side to to sugar production. I not, not, don't want to go too much into it on a fun podcast, but uh, you know, wh- wherever you hear of the word, pl- there, there were cocoa plantations and there were sugar plantations. And whenever you hear the word plantation, it brings up an image of slavery. And the um, workforce involved in the production of both cocoa and, and sugar were generally uh, slave labor. Yeah. And uh, in fact, what, te- what happened, I think it was with uh, Cadbury's, was that there was a there was a court case uh, because they were actually still employing slave labor to produce uh, sugar after slavery had been abolished. No way. And 
the court, uh, th- th- they claimed that they had no idea that yeah. slave labor was being used in the production of, of, of their product. Yeah. And uh, the court believed them. The court, the court looked at whatever, whatever, everything else that they were doing and said, yeah, we, we think that's probably true. You probably didn't understand or know what was going on. Right. Okay. Okay. But I, 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 was, I was fascinated by the fact that um, on the plantations, anyway, uh, cocoa grows on the trunks of trees. It doesn't grow off the tree. It's sort of, uh, the cocoa pods actually grow out of the bark. Really? Yes. I'd always, always sort of imagine them hanging from palm-like leaves, you know, like a, a, a banana or a coconut. But they actually grow out of the bark. They grow out of the bark. How interesting. And then there's a huge process to actually... I mean, who was the first person who thought, you see that thing that looks like a rugby ball? I wonder what's inside it. <laughs> Getting inside it, seeing this little white pulpy mush with, with a yes. few seeds in it. And going, yes. I wonder what would happen if we dried that out and then, and then, and then roasted it and then yeah. ground it up and then... <laughs> You can only assume it's, it's gone through an awful lot of trial and error, yes. can't you? you know, it, one of them fell on the floor and it broke open and someone scooped out the contents and ate it and went, yuck. Yeah, that's really bitter and horrible. I wonder if we can do anything to make it less yuck. <laughs> or, rather than just going, do you know what, that's yuck. I think we'll, we'll classify that yuck and leave it alone. Yes. <laughs> yes, well done them for having the determination to make something good out of it. <laughs> And, and white chocolate is, is based on cocoa butter. And generally speaking, most cocoa butter isn't used in, in chocolate. It's, it, right. They put a bit in yes, uh, just to sort of soften it up a bit. But in, about the, in the 1930s, there was a problem with people being very skinny, obviously, because there'd been a, a lot of uh, poverty and famine. Yeah. And they, they realized that this uh, cocoa butter was, was quite fattening. Right, and that it would be good to feed it to children ah. um, to to fatten them up. Okay, but they didn't want to just give them like, cocoa butter, which was horrible and sort of like yes. smacked of milk and yes. nasty. So they made it into um, a medicine called uh, Nestrovit. Right, and Nestrovit, uh, the the bars of Nestrovit, which I think you can still buy Nestrovit on the continent. Right, so that was renamed in the 1930s as Milky Bar. Is that so? And we all remember the the famous advertising, the Milky Bars Bars are on me, with the Milky Bar Kid. Yes, there have been several Milky Bar Kids. I I haven't actually researched it, but I know there's been at least seven. Right, okay. Yeah, well, they they do have a tendency to carry on being quite young, don't they, even though the adverts have been going on for 40-odd years. (laughs) Yes, yes. The British side of chocolate is slightly different to the, to the American side of chocolate. The, the, the interesting one is, is Forrest Mars, I guess. Yes. And, yes. And, the, and the Mars bar. But the Mars bar was actually invented by his dad. Yes, whose name was Frank C. Mars. Yes, Frank, and they had a bit of a falling out. Yeah. There's a Mars bar that has the extra nuts in it, uh, yes. which was called Snickers, Origi- originally called Snickers. And then called Marathon and now called Snickers again. Oh, really? It started off as Snickers? Yes. And, oh. and Snickers, the reason it was called Snickers, because Snickers was Forrest Mars's uh, racehorse. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he, named, he named the bar after his racehorse. Now that's interesting. So I, I grew up calling them Marathon bars and was slightly outraged when they changed their name to Snickers. But actually, the Marathon was the interloper then. Exactly. There are some sweets which are still around, but they're not in their original format. Okay. Um, so, examples. for example, when I was younger, you could buy a Duncan's Walnut Whip, and the Duncan the Duncan's Walnut Whip had not only a half a half a half a walnut on the top, yes. it had half a walnut on the bottom underneath the, the so white a whole stuff. walnut in total. So a whole walnut. Wow. And was based around a whip. And obviously, with smaller hands, it was enormously but much bigger. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> a bit like the, the, there's a massive internet debate about the the size of the wagon wheel, isn't there? That's how, that, I guess. Oh, that's it's how. all over the place, isn't it? I can't make my mind up on these things. I um I opened up a, a bag of Monster Munch. Do you remember Monster Munch I crisps? Um, and I'm I'm convinced they're smaller than they used to be. And I was telling someone about this, and they said, "No, it's just that your hands are larger now." Yes. So I'm I'm on the fence about that debate about the wagon wheels. <laughs> we we, talk, we talked about round tree a little bit. There, there's a fascinating story with round trees, which I love. They, they, again, they're another set of people who were very 
um, inclusive and wanted to help the, the general population. They, yeah. they noticed that um, there were a lot of people in poverty. Right. And so they, they produced products that, that, that helped and gave away a lot of charity. And they actually built a, a town of their own, which I, I'd never heard of, called Earswick. Oh, no, I've never heard of that. So there's Earswick outside Sheffield. is actually a Roundtree's town. Oh, okay. And again, provided free healthcare, free schooling, free yes. housing, you know, all sorts of things to, to, to help people. Yes. And um, the, the, the lovely story that I love about Roundtree's is that uh, one day um, the Roundtree family were sitting around minding their own business making Roundtree's chocolate. And uh, this French guy walked in uh, with, a, with a bag and he said, would you like to try my pastilles? And at that time, pastilles were only made in France. Ah. And so uh, the Roundtree family said, well, let's, let's, try, let's try a few of your pastilles. And they liked them. And the guy said, so would you like to buy my pastilles? Then they said, no, but we'll buy you. We will employ you to help us oh. to make pastilles uh, here in, in Sheffield. Wonderful. And so they uh, employed him. Gave him a, uh, a research facility, and two years later, he, he made about a ton of them. Yeah, and gave gave the samples to the family and uh, said, "So, so, what do you think? Would you mind throwing them in the river because they're horrible?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a shame! And go. We know you can do better than this. Go back and try again. Yes. So this he tried again. They tried them and they went. Mm, we think you can do better. So he grumbled away off and um, came back with the third lot. And they said, yep, these are perfect. And those were the ones that became Roundtree's pastels. Wow. And then he carried on for another year or so and came up with fruit gums. Right. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. No, when you first started talking about Roundtree's chocolate, I thought I had no idea Roundtree ever made chocolate. Yes. Roundtree's used to make, um, used to make chocolate. They used to make boxes of chocolates, in fact. Okay. And, and er, early boxes of chocolates um, were so expensive that, that a box of chocolates would, be, would cost you the equivalent of the working man's monthly rent. Monthly rent? A, a month's rent for a box of chocolates. Wow. Which is why I think they still had that hangover when I was younger, which was like you give, if you give somebody a box of chocolates, it's like, wow, you're giving me a box of yes. chocolates. That's really something. Yes. There was a, there's actually a link between the invention of the cinema and chocolate, okay. which is that the chocolate companies thought, well, pe you know, people are taking chocolates into the cinema. Yeah, um, We need to get boxes of chocolates into the cinema because we can make more money off a box of chocolates than we do off a bar. Right, yes. People weren't that wild about it because they would probably you know, bite into like a, a ginger and go, that's horrible, yeah. I, I don't fancy that, yeah. and put it back in the box or just throw it away or spit it out. So that's why they started to make them in different shapes so that you could actually feel the box of chocolates in the dark and know which was which. Oh, my word. So, almost like a, a, a braille for chocolate. Braille chocolate. That's brilliant. <laughs> now, in our, our various musings over different forms of, of sweets, um, I came across M&M's. And it has never crossed my mind as to why they're called M&M's. Um, but they are named after the two people who invented them, which is Mars and Murray. Uh, so they were created by Forrest Mars, who was the son of, of Mr. Mars Sr., who, who came up with the company, and Bruce Murray, who was the son of the president of Hershey at the time. Uh, so these two fellas got together. And they were inspired by um, seeing British troops eating Smarties in, in the, the Second World War and thought, well, that's, that's nice. We'll Americanize that slightly. We'll put our initials on the shell. We'll stuff some of them with peanuts and, um, and away you go. And, and that's how M&Ms came into being. So at the same time as Joseph Fry was coming up with the bar of chocolate, yeah. uh, there was a Swiss guy called Lint and a Swiss guy called Sprungli. Right, okay. Who were also making uh, chocolate drinks. And by the way, their hot, their hot chocolate is amazing. I would imagine. Um, but what they came up with was a way of kneading the chocolate using a, a, a clamshell. So it was okay. pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And when you knead that, that chocolate paste, what happens is all of the uh, vinegars and the, and the acids in it 
uh, evaporate. Right. So what you end up with is a much smoother, sweeter uh, chocolate okay. than, than was available at the time normally. So this, this clamshell way of, of kneading the chocolate led to this, that, that specific taste of Swiss chocolate. Well, I think uh, that's pretty much exhausted our, our topic of confection for this week. I'm really hungry now. Yes. So let's go and have, uh, have a snack. Thank you once again for joining us and uh, listening to our absolute twaddle. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it uh, as much as we've enjoyed doing it. It's been fun. And uh, if you like this kind of thing, please come back again for, for more next week. Uh, do all of the things you're supposed to do with podcasts. Like, subscribe. Tell your friends about us. Comment. And um, please join us again next time on Factorally. Thank you very much for joining us. See you soon. Bye-bye.